Life in the trenches had by now taken on a grim reality of its own. New recruits, stuffed full of propaganda, believed the Western Front was the best place to get covered in glory. Covered in mud was more likely. Corporal Henry Gregory recalls what it was like fighting in the trenches in November 1917. This was the winter when the trenches gave way and fell in. What a state they were in. They were filled two or three feet in water and mud. We were always soaked well above the knees and plastered in mud. We had to sleep and stand about all day in this condition. The discomforts at this time were terrible and can hardly be realised by those who weren't there. Despite the wet conditions, pure drinking water was hard to come by. Men collected it from shell holes and hoped that dead bodies weren't floating just below the surface. Food was also hard to come by, especially when enemy shelling prevented resupply. Tasteless bully beef, moldy bread and smelly cheese was sometimes supplemented by that great trench delicacy, fried rat. With water that had run off dead bodies, and rats that had fed off dead bodies, and the lice and fleas that came off the rats, little wonder the trench-bound soldiers were soon suffering agonies from dysentery and worse. Soldiers on both sides sometimes had to put up with these conditions for months at a time. Everyone agreed that living like this was no joke. But jokes were one of the few things that made trench life bearable. Humor, mateship, and good-natured resourcefulness often provided the only relief from a hell that quickly crushed your idealism if it didn't crush your life. Staying alive during these extended periods required luck as much as training, since danger was everywhere. The chief danger was fear. Fear of the dozens of forms of unexpected death that haunted soldiers every day. It drove men mad, an ever-present threat. Also ever-present were artillery bombardments. A big enemy shell could collapse a whole trench and bury its defenders. And it wasn't just enemy shells one had to fear. As many as 75,000 Allied troops were estimated killed by Allied shells that dropped short. Ever-present shelling also led to shell shock. Some senior officers, usually ones who spent little time near the trenches, treated shell-shocked men as cowards trying to get out of fighting. But the effects of shelling were real enough to Sergeant Archie Barwick. In five minutes, 75 big shells landed near us. The ground rocked and swayed from the concussion. Men were driven stark, staring mad, and more than one of them rushed out of the trench over towards the Germans. Any amount of them could be seen crying and sobbing like children, their nerves completely gone. Between 1914 and 1918, the British Army identified 80,000 men as sufferers of shell shock. But a much larger number with the symptoms were classified as malingerers and sent back to the trenches. There, they may also have faced poisonous gas. Outlawed by the Hague Convention as a criminal weapon, poison gas was nevertheless used by all sides. Heavier than air, it rolled along the ground like mist 
and could fill a trench or dugout before sleeping soldiers could raise the alarm. A Canadian nurse left this record of a young gas victim she treated. He was sitting up in bed, fighting for breath, his lips plum-colored. He was a magnificent young Canadian, past all hope in the asphyxia of chlorine. I shall never forget the look in his eyes as he turned to me and gasped, I can't die. Is it possible that nothing can be done for me? 